podcasting to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. Welcome to The Theory of Wine. In today's podcast, we're exploring alternative routes into the wine world, and we'll be talking with Mark Supsick, a wine entrepreneur, and Penny Fitzgerald of the Traveling Vineyard. We're going to learn about creative ways to make a living in wine. Stick around. My guest, Mark Supsick, is a wine and spirits professional who's making a name for himself as an independent wine consultant, writer, and video producer. Mark Supsick is a WSET diploma, certified wine and spirits professional from the Philly Burbs. Over the past five years, he's been making a name for himself with the uncharacteristically down-to-earth approach to wine, spirits, and food pairing. He's even been described as a rebel sommelier. Educated and experienced with a broad depth of knowledge, he prefers sipping wine in ripped jeans and flannel on the back patio while listening to Iron Maiden. The word iconoclast comes to mind. As a YouTube host, Mark has produced over 200 videos about wine, spirits, and food and culture. You can find them all on his channel. And as an events coordinator, host, and teacher, he's led private wine events and tastings for thousands of people at all levels of experience. Clients and followers certainly find his approach refreshing. Mark's an increasingly showing up in prominent wine and lifestyle publications, blogs, podcasts, radio, and media over the past few years. In fact, Philly Style Magazine recently dubbed him as the Private Sommelier, a new breed of wine professionals who are reinventing themselves to meet the needs of today's wine lover. Mark Subsick, welcome to The Theory of Wine. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Brad. Yeah, I'm really glad you're here. So you're you're just outside of Philadelphia. Um, mm -hmm. We're out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I know you know a lot of the wines that we have out here. I've uh, been following your work on, on your um, Mark Subsix Wine Living on your YouTube channel and, right. and a Facebook follower for a long time. And I think what you're doing is pretty awesome. And I think the rest of the world ought to know that too. Can you kind of tell us how you came to where you are today? What's your path? How'd you get here? Well, uh, well, it's, uh, it's hard to sum up in, uh, well, I'll try to be as br uh, brief as possible, but yeah, yeah um, I uh, worked as a, I, well, I still do actually, I work uh, on the side as a web consultant, so I do a lot of digital media and graphics, uh, I spend a lot of time working in packaging, uh, graphic design, and the uh, digital media, and uh, my wife and I were fortunate enough to be able to travel a lot, um, you know, it was a decent job, paid well, mm -hmm. and she was doing pretty well for herself too at the time, so uh, we started to travel a lot, and as and uh, as a visitor in other countries, you you know, you sort of observe things that you don't see in your own culture. Right. And uh, what really appealed to me about the European culture in particular was uh, how they still take a lot of time out for family, for friends, and to sort of, um, you know, make sure that they value personal time. Right. So that really kind of left an indelible impression upon me when we traveled. And uh, I wanted to sort of bring that back here to the United States. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, because I noticed, uh, you know, as we were kind of climbing the corporate ladder in our own jobs, we were sort of losing touch with ourselves, with our family, with our friends. And uh, I really felt that that was something that really needed to be brought back to our culture here. So um, by way of wine and food, which are very important in the European culture, um, I got interested in make, making wine originally. So that's that's how I got into this. I wanted to be a wine maker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I actually bought my own equipment and set up in my garage to make about 3000 gallons of wine and uh, found that yeah, yeah, it was nice, but I found that you really don't make a lot of money in the wine business. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's also really tough to get around the laws here locally. Uh, right. So, yeah, they, as they would have it, as my township would have it, they wanted me to move the location to a, a separate building, have a health inspector come in and all that. And um, wow. yeah, yeah. So at that point, I found that maybe making wine, being a winemaker was the path for me. So I went to school and I started to study. And I think sort of by accident, I wound up at the Wine and Spirit Education Trust in London. I really thought it was going to be more for somebody who, like UC Davis, somebody to right. uh, a body that would educate you about wine and wine making. But really what it ended up being was an educational body that helps people who work in the wine business and the wine industry. Good. So, Good. yeah, yeah. After three years of studying very intensely, I came out on the other side with a diploma and really nothing to do with it. Um, so they don't really do much as far as placement. We, I live in Pennsylvania where there really isn't much of an infrastructure or a wine industry here. Right. So I had to sort of invent my own role, which is how I came to wine living my business. Okay. So you've been doing your wine living business for how long now? About five years. So okay. since, uh, 2013, I got my diploma certification from the WSET. All right. That's, that's pretty awesome. So um, you're just, you're kind of a pioneer. You're making your own way, figuring things out as you go. Can you tell me about the wine living and what's, what your business is about? 
Yeah, well, as you know, in the wine business, I mean, there's uh, very few paths that somebody with a sommelier certification can go. Right. Uh, most people go work in a restaurant. Uh, some people go work for hotels or in the hospitality industry. Um, I didn't want any of that. You know, I hear some stories, and I'm sure if you know anybody who's worked in the restaurant industry before, it's a tough business to get into, especially at 42 years old, as I was at the yeah. time. It wasn't something I was really enthusiastic or interested in getting involved in. Late nights, weekends, I have a nice house. I have a wife that I like a lot. So really didn't want to get into, an, uh, you know, that line of work and getting away from my life and my house. So um, I decided to just sort of uh, teach people what I learned in the WSET. So I started to go to local businesses in my town and give these wine tastings out. And I was at one of these wine tastings and uh, somebody said to me, you know, you should do this privately for people in their homes. You know so much about wine. Why not share your knowledge? So that's what I started to do. So I started to set them up privately in people's homes and it just kind of went out of control from there. I started yeah. to get calls and people started to call me up to do private tastings. I got calls from uh, companies, from organizations, corporate, private, all sorts of things. So that's sort of what caused the business to, uh, that was the impetus for the business anyway. Right. So is that is that the core function of your business right now or are you kind of spreading your wings out and doing other things? Well, you know, I, when I left my corporate job and I got into the wine business, I thought, I would never do graphic design, web design, media, branding, or any of that again. Right. But then I hit a slow point with the wine business. Right. And you realize, why throw out the baby with the bathwater? You know, Absolutely. maybe I could use the 20 years of experience that I have in the media and branding business. Why not marry that together with what I do with wine? Right. So as soon as I did that, I found that I could fill in sort of the gaps in business. So the slow parts of the season, summertime things like that. Now I can do consulting. So I can consult for restaurants. I consult for um, local importers. I do branding for importers. I do websites for people in the wine business. So suddenly it kind of forms a whole picture. Right. You know, I, th I think, you know, as I'm around the wine world, talking to wineries, you know, we have these core groups of people that do this sort of things, but you know, I think the world is open for folks like you that have this knowledge of, of the product itself, but also of this marketing and, and, and design work and, you know, I, I do some work for a winery out here and, and we're, we're always kind of keeping our eyes open for, for new talent and people that can kind of spice up our brand or, you know, we're using some of these uh, existing websites like through Wine Direct that maybe isn't quite intuitive to use and, you know, an extra hand or somebody that has that knowledge really makes a difference and, you know, leaning on folks like you would be a real benefit. So you're, you're a consultant, you're doing some graphic work, you're doing some marketing, you're doing some talks. Um, what's, what's your, you get a, you get a YouTube channel. You get how many videos up there now? There's a whole bunch. Yeah. Well, in total, there's probably about 200, but I took a few of them down because the first ones were pretty bad. <laughs> right. So yeah. I mean, you know, when I started out, I really didn't know what I was doing. Well, I didn't really have a goal or a purpose. Gotcha. Uh, it didn't really kind of like gel until maybe the first year I was doing it. Okay. Um, so, you know, I took a couple of YouTube courses. I learned that there's actually a science to putting a YouTube video together and a YouTube channel together. Um, and, you know, it's really about answering questions for people. Right. So when you think about YouTube, it's owned by Google. It's a search engine, right? Right. So people are using YouTube to find answers to questions. They're looking for pro problems to be solved. Right. So as soon as I kind of figured that out and I realized that this is how you use the YouTube channel, then the it started to take off and the views started to take off too. So, yeah, currently there are about 185 live videos on the channel. Okay. So what, what current problem are you helping folks to answer right now? I mean, what's your, what's your, maybe your most recent proud, proudest video that you've, you've released that you really think is pretty cool? Well, things really kind of took off as soon as I figured out that you're, you're there to help people solve problems. And um, you do wine tastings, I think, do you? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, you know, you know, you do wine tastings and for as much as I know, for as much as I've learned uh, through my studies, you still get some very basic questions from people. Mm -hmm. It's always the same questions. People want to know whether you use a screw a screw top or a cork is better. Right. People want to know how to serve wine. They want to know what temperatures to serve wines at. So if you use some uh, basic tools like Google AdWords, you can look through the internet searches and find out what people are looking for. And one of the most uh, commonly asked questions is what are the best wines for beginners to try? So mm -hmm. what are the best red wines and the best white wines for beginners to try? So uh, about... A year ago, I started a series called The Best Red Wines for Beginners and The Best White Wines for Beginners, and currently those are my most watched. I think the uh, one about Merlot is at 25,000 views. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. So 
be, beginner wine. Kind of walk me through. What do you mean when you say beginner wine? Because I'm I'm hoping that this this podcast reaches people that are you know like like folks like us that got some experience, but also people that are like new to the wine world and curious. Like, what do you, when you say a beginner wine, what does that mean to you? Beginners are people who probably drink wine now, but they don't think too much about it. Gotcha. So it's more like a meditative exercise. You know, it's getting people, and this is the same thing that I do in my wine tastings and my wine events. Okay. It's about getting people to slow down and pay attention. Mm. So I'm probably appealing or I'm looking to appeal to the people who probably already drink wine, but don't know much about it, don't think much about it. But if you just give them like a little piece of information that kind of takes their game up to the next level, Right. Then they start going to the store and looking for better wines. They start looking for different varietals. They look, start looking for different countries. So it's just like kind of planting a seed to inspire people who drink wine right now, but really don't think too much about it, to think a little bit more about it and to go out and seek better wines. I, I love this idea of, of, of wine, appreciate, wine appreciation or wine enjoyment as a meditative process, really, where, you, where you're really slowing it down and you're yeah, kind of digging down deep. And that ties right into the original inspiration for, for my business was right. going to Europe and seeing how the European cultures kind of take the time. I mean, if you've been, you've been to Europe before, so you probably you've seen in places like France and Italy or Spain where they actually they close everything down around 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock and they, they go home, they have lunch with the family, they take a little siesta and then they go back to work at like 4 o'clock. So it's about really kind of like taking these little t these islands in your day to just enjoy yourself and meditate a little bit on the joys of life and the pleasures of a good glass of wine, a good meal. Right. That's awesome. Um, so what's new, what's happening in, in your wine world right now that you're maybe a little bit excited about? Well, I'm finding as I go along, um, finally starting to get a little traction with this. I think, you know, I've been out for about four years now on my own and the first two years were really tough. Yeah. Um, anytime you start a new business, it's really tough. So I think things are finally starting to gain a little traction. Um, originally, I was a little scared to get into doing large groups. People used to tell me all the time, you should really go down to the city, go to Philadelphia, do large right. banquets, do large events. And that's really not the direction that I wanted to take this in. But I'm finding that I'm starting to get invited to do more of those. Mm -hmm. And once you do one or two and you get over the initial fear of doing them, it's not such a bad thing. And actually, to be frank, the money's a lot better too. Absolutely. So yeah, for right now, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that finally after maybe three or four years of getting into this and thinking that oh, maybe people just don't care that much about wine, it's just finally starting to snowball now. And I'm getting excited about the fact that, oh, maybe this really is something that I have here. Yeah, yeah. It's, the ramp up is a little bit slower than we would like, I'm sure. So uh, you, you were talking, um, we, I saw a post on your Facebook page about some wine projects that you have in the works. Yeah, well, here in the state of Pennsylvania, and I don't think this is unique to Pennsylvania, but I think it's probably the most extreme example uh, of the, the liquor control having a the liquor control board having a monopoly you know, on the state business. Right. Um, so a lot of people have a real problem with that here in Pennsylvania because, you know, the government's selling people wine and at the same time they're preaching to people about overconsumption. Right. The police are pulling people over for DUIs, you know, yeah. so there's a conflict of interest there. But um, in the state of Pennsylvania, I think that represents the, the liquor control system represents about $2 billion worth of revenue for them every year. Wow. So they're not going to let that go easily. Um, right. And because it's a government operated entity, it leaves a lot to be desired. It's mm -hmm. operated much in like any bureaucratic organization. There are a lot of things missing, the details are left out. The right, people right. who work at the stores don't really care too much about wine. In many cases, they're not even educated about wine. Mm. So there's a real challenge in the state of Pennsylvania to get good wines at the store, to get good information about the wines, and also as an importer, or as a winery, to sell those wines as well. Right. So. There's a loophole in the state law now, and this is no big secret. A lot of people know about this already. Um, we've even contact. We have a lawyer, and we've reached out with our lawyer to the state of Pennsylvania and asked them, and they're okay with this. But what you do in the state of Pennsylvania, or what you can do in the state of Pennsylvania, is you can set up a winery license, and you can invite outside wineries to get a license within your your winery. Okay. And at that point, then you can sell, you can bottle and sell their wines. All right. So you're not just limited to the Pennsylvania wines. You can get them from anywhere in the world. We're getting them from right. Washington and Oregon. And we're going to put our own proprietary labels on them. Nice. And we're going to sell them directly to the, cons the consumer. You have a name set up for your winder yet? 
Yeah, it's called the Backroads Wine Company. Backroads Wine Company. And yep. you wouldn't have to have a label that we could look at, would you? Well, we have, yeah, hey, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you're, watching, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see it right now, but we'll, if Mark would share us a copy of his uh, label, I'll post it, yeah. the blog post that accompanies this video or this This audio. is one of the wines that we're going to be selling. This is actually a New Jersey wine, delicious wine. It's a blend of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Carignan, and I believe um, Sincel. But it's, um, okay. it's, it's a Trinity wine. This is actually my own label. I designed this. So nice. you see how all these skills kind of come into play. Yeah. So I designed a lot of the labels. We're going to be selling these. These are proprietary blends, but they're basically um, what they call Shiner bottles. They're bottles without labels from other wineries. Right. This one here is in particular is from New Jersey. So are the grapes grown in New Jersey or are they brought in and processed in New Jersey? Nope, they're grown in New Jersey. Okay, no kidding. So, you know, we get this a lot. You, you can grow grapes in New Jersey or you can grow grapes in Pennsylvania or Michigan or Iowa or wherever. <laughs> uh, you know, with your, you know, with your movie that you made, the, yeah. you can, they make wine in every state of the United States. Absolutely. Now. Yeah, it's not, it's not a big mystery anymore. Um, the problem right now, I guess, is infrastructure. So mm -hmm. in states like Pennsylvania, they don't have the infrastructure set up. We've only been doing this for about 30 years. Right. So um, there are, kind of isolated they're not really close to each other like in california or napa valley you can throw a stone in any direction to hit a winery yeah. whereas here in pennsylvania they may be 40 miles apart from each other right so is there any wines that you're like really digging right now i mean this is a chance to kind of maybe talk a little bit about that before we sign yeah, off certainly yeah I, i'm i'm a lot like you i'm a homeboy i like pennsylvania wines um you know i'm really all about the underdogs and yeah. in the 15 years that i've been traveling around my state of pennsylvania and tasting the wines, they've gone from almost undrinkable to pretty spectacular. Yeah, um, They did a competition last year, sort of like the Judgment of Paris, but we went up against California and a lot of Pennsylvania wines really came out on top. So we're finally getting to the point, I think, where our wines here in Pennsylvania are drinkable, but I'm also excited about places like Maryland and Virginia yeah. and New Jersey and New York. They're all sort of coming onto the map now as winemakers gain the knowledge and also the skills and the equipment they're starting to make better wines in almost every state. So um, I brought one up here to show to you. Uh, this is from Lubbock, Texas. Oh. This is uh, McPherson Cellars, and uh, they do a lot of Spanish grapes. So this one here is, uh, it's called Le Copain Red. It's the Companions. And it's got Syrah, Cab Sauve, Cinso, Carignan, and Mourvedre. Mm, okay. But... I'm very excited about wines from more obscure places now because, you know, I'm tired of hearing about California and France all the time. Yeah, so let's give this winery a plug again. Where They're from Texas, and what's the name of the winery? Lubbock, Texas. It's called McPherson Cellars. McPherson Cellars. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll have to try that. And so, you know, this is, this is the hope for the program like this is that it excites people to like, oh, I'm going to go to the website and check these guys out. And maybe if I can buy a bottle, if they ship it out of state, mm -hmm. they'll snag a bottle. Or maybe you ask your retailer, your wholesaler, or your wine merchant to kind of check into these things. So or even, you know, the next time they go to the store, if they don't know specifically, they don't remember what to ask for. They know that it came from Texas. So maybe they can go looking for a Texas wine. There are just so many amazing wines out there. And there's so many great people like yourself that are, that are boosters that are, I, I love the fact that you're a rebel sommelier because mm -hmm. you know, in my, in my heart of hearts, I'm the same way. You know, there's so many great wines out there and to limit ourselves to just two, two or three regions is just ridiculous when there's so many great grapes and so many great people to, to, to meet and, and, and try. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for talking with us today and sharing your story with us. Um, this has been a, a, a wonderful experience, and maybe we can have you on the show again sometime. Fantastic. Uh, find me at wineliving.info. That's my website, or you can go to YouTube and yeah. just look up the Wine Living channel. Mark Supsick is the host of Mark Supsick's Wine Living, an informative and fun YouTube program. Wine consultant as a wine rebel, you know he's fascinating and an out-of-box thinker. Want to know about Mark, Mark's uh, wine work? Check out his webpage at wineliving.info. That's wineliving.info. I'll post links to his website and contact information on the theoryofwine.com blog. Mark, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Brad. Talk to you soon. Hey, wine friends. Each week, The Theory of Wine will bring you interesting content from winemakers, wine growers, wine rebels, writers and bloggers, and serious wine nerds from around the world. Want to join us? Connect with us at theoryofwine.com, on Facebook, or Twitter. Cheers, friends.
My guest, Penny Fitzgerald, is an Emerald Director and Wine Guide with the Traveling Vineyard, whose mission is to share the love of good wine with the world. Penny has consistently achieved the distinction of being among Traveling Vineyard's top five elite elitists, earning multiple incentive trips in elite retreats to fabulous destinations around the world. She's also earned numerous company awards, including being honored as Traveling Vineyard's annual Spirit of Vineyard for service to the company and team members across the country. Penny's a sought-after wine event speaker and is presented at Traveling Vineyard's annual national conventions and multiple regional events offering training and motivation for other leaders and wine guides in the field. Penny's a great nose for wine and is thrilled to be a judge at several wine competitions, including the Mid-America Wine Competition led by Bob Foster and Master Sommelier and Master of Wine, Doug Frost. Penny leads and supports a team of 600 wine guides from across the country and loves sharing the wine guide's life. Penny Fitzgerald, welcome to The Theory of Wine. Thanks, Brad. I'm so glad to be here. Really happy to have you. So we've known each other for a little while. Little disclaimer, you know, we're, we're, we're not we're not first time meeting here, so we've known each other for a while. But, you know, I, I know your story to be really interesting. And I wanted to share with the wine world, like, different ways that we can get into the world of wine. And, you know, some of us eke out existences on the fringes of the wine world. Some of us are really in-depth working at wineries or working at retail stores. Your story is a little bit different. How would you get into the world of wine? Well, I always have loved wine. <laughs> Um, and I, I was working a corporate job before. I loved my corporate job too in sales um, and sales support. Loved it, loved the people I worked with, but uh, the corporate world was getting a little bit um, much. Um, it was kind of becoming um, a grind <laughs> and I didn't like to do that. So um, I wondered if I could combine my love of wine and a career in some way. I wasn't really sure how to make that happen. Um, but a girlfriend of mine had heard about Traveling Vineyards. She said, why don't you contact the company and get some information? Um, you know, kind of check it out and see what, see what you uh, can find out. And that's what I did. I, I wasn't sure I wanted to get into direct sales because uh, I'd had that kind of misconception about what direct sales could be. And But in the end, I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? I drink the wine and... <laughs> You know, ne never uh, do anything with it or maybe you know, do try it for a while, but that was 12 and a half years ago. <laughs> oh, wow. So was there an aha moment? You said, wow, wine is really speaking to me. This is really kind of, I, I want to do something with this wine. Yeah, I think I think from the very beginning when I started doing the wine tastings and seeing people just light up, mm -hmm. uh, putting the right food with wine or understanding um, the, the different characteristics about a wine or the, the aromas, the just the whole experience of wine and sharing that with a group of people is really fun. And I, I think I was kind of bitten by that bug. Really yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm thinking about the traveling vineyard now that you, you've been involved with them for quite some time. You're an Emerald director. What is an Emerald director? What does that mean? Yeah. Emerald director. We have several tiers of leadership within our company that you can earn. Um, mm -hmm. You achieve these levels and um, it's basically um, you're leading a team. You're you're inviting people to join you in this wonderful wine world, mm -hmm. and uh, they do in-home wine tastings. We all do, and all of us uh, across the company do the in-home wine tastings, which are free to host and super fun, great experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we grow, as we build our team, um, we invite people to listen in uh, to the opportunity. If it's right for them, they join our team, and then they'll have people join their team, and and we get a bonus from the company um, based on what what they do. So we, um, we support our team by helping them be successful. Okay. And as you grow up, then Emerald director just essentially means, um, I'm one of the elite leadership team. Right. There are about 13, I think we're 16 of us now. Um, okay. Country. So super fun. You've yeah. been successful. You've been able to motivate other wine lovers like yourself to create teams of their own. But you know, the neat thing, what I heard was like, um, I can host a wine party. <laughs> Tell me about what, if I was to host a wine party, what's, what's that mean? <laughs> oh, it's really, really fun. Um, so hosting wine party just means inviting your friends, like 15 to 20 friends over and having one of us, a wine guide, come into your home and teach you and your guests, your, your friends, about wine. Um, we do a little bit of food and wine uh, pairing knowledge. Um, talk about why you serve wine at a certain temperature, how you um, store it, those kinds of things. And um, then at the end of the event, at the end of the, the tasting, um, you as the host and the guests get to order whatever wine you'd like from our company. And as a host, it, it's free to host. I bring five bottles of wine to share with you and the guests. You get bonuses and discounts and free wine based on what your friends want to order from the company. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Okay. 
Well, that's cool. So I know a lot of folks that I encounter are kind of put off or kind of afraid about wine. They have a certain level of knowledge they feel they have to have before they can really enjoy wine. What do you say to that kind of mentality or those kind of folks? Yeah, well, at Traveling Vineyard, we're not wine snobs. So we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't require you to know anything about wine. Um, it, it's just fun. And we, we like to share that experience and we help you with that. So doing the in, in-home wine tasting, you're there with your friends. Um, one of us, a wine guide, will come in and help you understand how to taste wine, what wine's about. So it's a non-intimidating atmosphere and a, and a really fun way to learn about wine. Right. So what's what's one of your best memories of, of, as when you first started, like maybe going to somebody's house and doing a wine tasting? Do you have some good memories from that days? Yeah, one of, one of my first wine tastings um, was with friends who were mostly beer drinkers. Mm. So they had very little experience with wine. Um and I, I remember them just kind of lighting up <laughs> when, when they try something that they liked and they didn't like every single wine, but they, you know, it was a place to start. And some of those same guests and customers have stayed customers through, you know, it's been 12 years now. So um, now they're drinking big, bold, red, you know, big cabs and yeah. really digging in more to something a little bit more sophisticated and really loving it. Cool. So tell me about the wines you guys have. I mean, how, how do you select your own wine? I mean, you, you have your own labels. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. we are a winery. So we um, have two wine making facilities, one in upstate New York and one in California. And we bring grapes and juice from around the world. So oh, we'll, nice. we'll partner with vintners and um, vineyards and bring grapes and juice and blend and bottle our own and that's the wine so that it's um, exclusive to us. Um, and, and yeah, you won't find them out in stores, restaurants other websites only through a wine guide or or his or her uh, website okay well tell me about one of the wines that you're right now that you're really excited about okay so right now i'm drinking um giovina <laughs> oh, nice i'm drinking water so <laughs> i'm envious i'm sorry <laughs> me too <laughs> yeah well giovina is, a, is an italian um wine that we have in, in here Monte Bocciano de Bruzzo. this one mm. is in 2017 that i happened to grab before we started talking tonight nice so, um, just love it. It's really um, crisp and it's got the, you know, the, the cherry, fla- cherry aromas and flavors. Love mm. it with anything pasta. <laughs> nice. And anything Italian. It's wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, I haven't found um, a wine that I don't like through us. We, we have a lot of um, award-winning wines and they're all fabulous. I probably gravitate more to the lighter body breads personally, right. but we've got a little something for everybody. Well, you, you, you speak of award-winning wines. You're also a wine competition judge. I know firsthand that you worked at the Mid-America Wine Competition with Doug Frost and Bob Foster. Tell me what that's like to work in a wine competition and how you can use that to your advantage when you're selling wine to folks. That is so fun. Um, I, well, I was able to become a wine judge through the training that I received through Traveling Vineyard, which was really cool. So um, through through lots of research. <laughs> lots of wine. Um, you know, putting them side by side, you really um, learn a lot about the wine. So I, I think um, through the training that I've received, I was able to kind of refine my palate and make it make, make it um, consistent. So um, that helped me become a wine judge. And then through the judging process, you know, you're sitting with master psalms and masters of wine and certified psalms, and they're um, – just a wealth of knowledge. They've traveled the world and they, right. um, yeah, they're really, you know, deep in the wine industry and you learn a lot from that. And then the other piece that I really enjoy is, um, when you're judging a wine, uh, at a competition, you'll judge several of the same varietal, um, side by side. And so when you have 12 Cabernets in front of you, you really learn the nuances of what a Cabernet from this region is versus that region. And, um, it really kind of um, helps hone your palate more. Oh, I bet. I bet. And I bet you use it to, you know, teach people how to appreciate the wine. And I think when people think about wine competitions, they think of the haughty type of wine people. But they're, you know, the wine, you know, the oh, Doug Frost, he's like the nicest guy in the world. Master Sommelier, Master Wine, one of four people in the world to have that credential. And you're sitting on the same t- judge, um, wine judging table with them. It's and that's good. pretty cool. And that kind of ups the cred and, you know, your wine street cred is up because of that. And that's pretty cool. Um, 
So if, if somebody is interested in getting into what you do professionally, or maybe they want to do it for, you know, maybe just host a party, or maybe they're really thinking about, you know, I'm wanting to kind of maybe either transition out of something I'm doing and try to find something more, something more fulfilling. What would you, what would you suggest to them? Well, I would love to have them contact me. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with them, give them more information so they can make the decision. Um, or if they'd like to host, I'd give them information on that. So um, if they contact me through my website or through social media or just um, text or call, okay. <laughs> I'm available. So what's the best thing for you? What's, what do you enjoy most out of this, this traveling vineyard thing? Oh, gosh, um, so much. I, I think the flexibility of having my own career in the wine industry is has been... Um, gosh, just, it's incredibly fulfilling to me because I have the flexibility of working my own schedule, working with who I want, um, setting my own hours and, and, um, goals. There's no, there are no quotas in our business and, and also no ceilings. So no one is telling you, you can't make more or we can't pay you more. It's all up to you. You do what you want and what you can. And, um, it's up to you, whichever, however you want to steer your career, it's available. Right. So it's not only fun, but you can make some money at it. And also, I think there's there's like a special trips for people that do pretty well. Can you tell me about those? Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a program called Thrive. It's an, our incentive program where um, wine guides have the opportunity on top of their uh, regular earnings and bonuses. Um, we have this incentive program where we can earn points and coins um, towards our marketplace. And uh, you can save those coins throughout the year and then cash them in for a, a fabulous trip every year. It's um, somewhere different. Okay. Um, and that's usually to a five-star resort. Um, our next one is to Costa Rica. I can't okay. wait. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, yeah. And then if you don't like to travel or, or you want to use your coins for something else, you can um, cash them in for uh, personal items or items for your home or luxury okay. goods. Um, it's really up to you what you how you want to um, be rewarded. So you you've been to a few of these kind of out of country destinations for your good work with the traveling vineyard. Can you tell me a little bit about one of the, your favorite places you've been to? Gosh, um, well, Costa Rica. We this is our second. This will be our second time to Costa Rica. That okay. was probably my favorite um, warm destination. Right. That was good. Okay, there's cold destinations. <laughs> <laughs> um, Portugal was amazing. Um, the elite leadership retreat um every year is taken somewhere uh, usually in wine country and uh we went to portugal last year um chile this year and um, portugal was just the warmth of the people was just so incredible it felt mm. very um welcoming and, and safe and uh, gosh the food was out of this world nice Maybe. yeah <laughs> so you're you're based in iowa and in florida if i'm not mistaken you have team members all across the country. Are there, I mean, if somebody's like, um, I'm in Alaska or I'm in Washington state or Oregon or places like even California, where you think everybody knows about wine, are, are there still, is there still a need for um, wine guides in those areas? Absolutely. We are really, um, even though we've been around for a while, we, um, we are kind of at the beginning of our growth um, okay. in many, many areas. So we're not saturated in any area where we are. Um, okay. Alaska, unfortunately is um, out of, uh, out of, it's not one of the states where we can gotcha. be um, there are we do do business though however in I think it's 38 states now so okay. are, we're open in a state near you okay. <laughs> is, there, is there a particularly hot state right now that seems to be really just rocking it with the wine and enjoying um, it and yeah, having fun it is just just starting to get fired up um, Texas is super hot mm. um, Colorado Wisconsin Gosh, everywhere. Um, yeah. We've got a lot of different um, areas that are blooming, but we definitely need people across the country. Cool. So if somebody's interested, I'll, I'll post links on my website about how to con how to connect with you. But so if I'm interested in being a wine guide, I'd connect with you and you might connect me with another wine guide to the yeah. in, in their area. So how, yeah, how would that work? That's possible. Or um, you could uh, work directly with me. Um, gotcha. So to just depends on um, what your needs are and where you are and what you what you want. So I'd be happy to give you information, help you get started, and support you along the way. Is there anything I haven't asked you that is like burning inside you that you need to share with with the folks that are watching this or listening to the show? Just um, you, you've been you've asked a lot of great questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm super excited about awesome. you know, but what you were saying about um, you know, kind of wanting to get into the business that is exactly where i was at the mm. beginning of this is i wanted to get in the wine world but i didn't know how and this has been everything i could imagine and more so i'm, I'm super excited to share it with with anyone who want to do what i did and 
run with it. That's fantastic. And Fitzgerald, Penny Fitzgerald, thank you so much for talking with us today and sharing your uh, love of good wine and sharing it with the world. It's been awesome having you here on the show. Thanks, Brad. I really appreciate it. This has been super fun. Right. Penny Fitzgerald is the Emerald Director and uh, Independent Wine Guide with the Traveling Vineyard. If you're interested in learning more about the Traveling Vineyard or how you might get involved, visit her webpage at ttvwinechick.com. That's ttvwinechick.com. I'll post links um, to her website and contact information on theoryofwine.com on my blog coming soon. Thank you, Penny. Thanks, Brad. Hey, wine friends. Thanks for hanging out with us for Theory of Wine podcast, brought to you by a new wine documentary called Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, now available online at winediamondsfilm.com and winerybooze.com, influence marketing for the wine industry. Thanks for listening, downloading, and sharing us. Find us at theoryofwine.com. See you next time. Cheers, friends.